My roommates and I found a key in our junk drawer. We finally discovered what it opens. I wonder how my life would be now if I hadn't let my idle curiosity get the best of me. No therapy, no doctor's bills, no nightmares, no constantly looking over my shoulder, agonizing over the thought that today could be my last. So, if I do disappear, at least I can leave my story behind. Okay, I can do this. You have a junk drawer in your house, right? Usually it's in your kitchen and holds all your miscellaneous items collected over the years. Our drawer contained a pair of dull scissors, two koozies from a DWI law firm, a broken screwdriver, and a, a brass antique key of unknown origin. Based on its size, the key looked like it opened a jewelry box, but I couldn't be sure. It mainly just collected dust in the back corner of the drawer. I glanced at it every time I needed to grab the scissors and wondered where it came from. My buddy Sam and I moved into the house shortly after we finished grad school. It was an older house, but it had a ton of space and a short commute downtown, where Sam and I both worked. We had another roommate named Rocky, who was a bit older than us, but we didn't mind. At the time, I worked in the mayor's office, while Sam worked in finance. Rocky was a line cook at one of the fancier restaurants in town. We all worked long hours, so naturally, we spent a lot of time together. Rocky had a ritual of cooking dinner for us when he returned from a long shift at work, usually drunk, and we became fast friends. He was quite the character, covered in tattoos and kept his hair wrapped up in a red bandana. I remember that he could fix anything and served as our de facto handyman because our ghost of a landlord was too lazy to make repairs. I assumed the key belonged to Rocky. After all, he liked to collect things, and the house was covered in baubles and trinkets he'd picked up over the years. My favorite being a life-size poster of Jackie Brown in our living room. I asked him about the key one day after a couple of beers, but he had no idea where it came from. The key had been in that drawer ever since he moved in around 10 years ago. Rocky figured it was his old roommate's key and left it alone since the two didn't get along. So that was the end of that. We settled further into our lives for a bit until a rainstorm nearly tore the roof off. Naturally, our landlord went missing, so Rocky had to patch the leak in the attic. I'll never forget that day. Rocky trotted downstairs, soaking wet and covered in dirt, headlamp still lit. Fellas, I think I found something, he said while grinning. Inside his hands, he held a lockbox. The box was metal, maybe iron, and almost totally rusted. The three of us stared quietly at it, wondering whether we should use the key. Fuck it, why not, Sam said, grabbing the key from the drawer. It was a perfect fit and the eroded lock fell to the ground with a thud. Rocky carefully lifted the top open and turned his headlamp on. What the fuck? He whispered. Inside, we found an old composition notebook filled page by page with odd symbols, a military-style compass, a map of Texas, and a faded Polaroid of a young woman with blonde hair smiling at what looked to be a birthday party. The back of the Polaroid listed the coordinates 30.565882, Negative 95.569881. Huh, Sam said while looking at his phone. It looks like these coordinates are in the Sam Houston National Forest. Not too far away at all. We should go, Rocky yelled. You two have always talked about taking me camping. It was true. Sam and I were astonished that Rocky, a man of many talents and adventures, had never been camping. We teased him often about it since Sam and I met in the scouts when we were kids and were well accustomed to the outdoors. Now seemed as good a time as any. Who knows how many people have lived in this house? Rocky pondered. Maybe we'll find something worth keeping. I dream about that day often. I'm locked to a chair and watching the three of us rummage through that box. And I'm pleading. No, screaming for Rocky to throw it away. I could feel my screams turn into laughter in a voice I don't recognize. We set off a few days later, listening to John Dever and Willie Nelson along the way, while Sam twiddled with his new sat-nav device. The three of us parked our car at base camp and prepared for the three-mile trek into the unknown, following the trails before the sat-nav incessantly beeped for us to go off the beaten path. We sidestepped broken branches and poison ivy before passing through a wooden archway into another forest clearing. Your destination is 500 meters north, the sat-nav droned. Ah, oh, fucking finally, Rocky muttered. You would have made a terrible scout, Sam teased. Rocky was about to retort, 
but something made him stop in his tracks. In front of us lay a path sandwiched by two rows of trees. Cloths, tattered t-shirts, and dirty towels hung from the branches. Some looked like they were tied, recently, while others were nearly rotted away. I'd never seen anything like it. Your destination is in 250 feet. The satnav hummed again as we marched forward, gazing at all the trees. At the end of the pathway lay a decaying stone well, covered in moss. Arrived, arrived, arrived. The satnav yelled at us before going quiet. Jesus, wonder how far down it goes, Sam asked. I picked up a rocket, threw it down the well, and was almost immediately greeted by a thud. Looks like someone plugged it a while ago. Sam said. Before Sam could finish his next sentence, Rocky had already plunged into the well. <laughs> what the fuck, Rocky? We both yelled as he disappeared into darkness without a sound. A couple of seconds of silence followed before we saw a flash of Rocky's headlamp. Hey guys, grab the rope. I found something. We pulled Rocky out of the well and cursed at him while he brushed the dirt off. He rolled his eyes and pulled out something from the back of his pants. It was an old wooden box, made to look like a small coffin. Someone engraved the same weird symbols from the composition notebook on its top. They'd crudely nailed the coffin shut, and several rusty nails protruded from the bottom. Creepy, Sam noted. I know what you're thinking. Are we idiots? Are we blind to the color red? Perhaps so. But back then, I didn't believe in the unknown and only accepted what I knew for certain. Now... I could only be certain of my inevitable demise. Rocky cracked open the coffin with his crowbar. It immediately splintered, and a brown mass fell onto the ground. It looked like a primitive doll made out of hard brown clay, with holes for eyes and an agonizing frown on its face. Several faded, blonde tufts of hair jutted out of the doll's head. It was then that I felt something off was going on. I felt an inexplicable sensation that someone was watching us. I darted my eyes around, but saw nothing, instead noticing that the cicadas had stopped humming. It was deathly quiet, barring a weird clicking sound. Guys, I think we should put that back, I know I said. Well, fellas, Rocky said, remind me never to go into the attic again. He then launched the doll into the sky. That's not going in the living room, Sam laughed. Well, at least we found something. Come on, let's get out of here and set up camp. We left the clearing and set up at the designated sites. Rocky regaled us with tales from his youth as we drank liquor by the campfire with a woman named Bonnie, whom we met on the trails and was camping with her dog. I had a great time, but as I went to sleep, I couldn't escape the feeling that we weren't alone. The next morning, we awoke, hung over, and drove back home, satisfied with our adventure. I think that redhead liked me. I should have given her my number. Rocky muttered while trying not to hurl. Things soon went back to normal, until one day we received a letter in the mail. Huh, Sam said. Looks like our landlord died. I don't think I ever met her. Yeah, she was like in a coma or something when I moved in. Rocky stated while digging through his backpack. Hey, has anyone seen my bandana? She was in a coma when you moved in? I asked. Yeah, something like that. Definitely bedridden. That's why we send our rent checks to the LLC. Huh. Always wondered. Sam started. Wait, it says here she died in a fall. How can someone in a coma die from a fall? Why would they even tell us how she died? Fuck, I think I left my bandana at the campsite. How am I supposed to go to work? Yeah, I think I left my hat there, Sam said. I have to stop mixing liquors. Rocky threw up his hands in frustration and left for work. It was the last time we saw him alive. I don't know the exact details, but the story is that Rocky stuck his hand in a pot of boiling water and nearly cooked his hand off. We heard from another line cook that Rocky didn't say a word until someone finally noticed what he'd done. It took four guys to pull his hand out of the pot, and only then did Rocky scream. We rushed to the hospital but Rocky had already died by the time we arrived. Doctors said they had him stabilized and were preparing him for surgery before he flatlined. We notified his family and attended his small funeral service in Long Island. Sam and I returned to the house and decided to break our lease. We hired movers to send Rocky's stuff back to his hometown and made plans to move into a new spot. 
that's when things started getting weirder. We received no communications from the LLC that managed the house, but someone had definitely been in the house while we were gone. Someone moved subtly, and the whole house seemed cleaner. We chalked it up to inspectors preparing the house for viewings, but it felt weird that someone was snooping around while we were gone. I noticed my reading glasses were also missing. The house also felt warm all the time. It was summertime in Texas, so it became almost unbearable to be in the house without the AC on. The thermostat always stayed low, so we figured it was a problem with the HVAC. We knew that new repairs were never going to happen, so we decided to brave it until our new place was ready. Two weeks was no problem. But soon, we wondered if that was possible. Sam woke up one morning, sore and covered in bruises, while the top of my head felt like someone had yanked some hair out of it. Every night started to feel the same. I would try to go to sleep, but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was in our house, poking around even though the nights were deathly silent. Sam finally gave up and told me he was going to spend the rest of the week at his girlfriend's. I was welcome to come and sleep on the couch. I told Sam to go ahead and that I would meet him the following night as I needed to pack a bag. Howdy ho, Smoochacho, Sam said on the way out and closed the door behind him. The next time I saw him was in a funeral casket. Car accident. Sam was on his way to his girlfriend Allie's house when his car veered into a telephone pole at over 90 miles per hour. He died on impact. Nearly every bone was broken in his body. I consoled Allie, who felt responsible. She read the autopsy report and noticed that while both arms were almost shattered, Sam's left arm appeared to have broken prior to the crash based on impact. She couldn't get over it and asked if Sam had injured himself earlier that week. I couldn't provide any answers. He was covered in bruises, but I would have noticed if he'd broken his arm. After grieving the loss of my two friends, I finally left the house and moved into an apartment across town, falling into a pattern of unhealthy coping mechanisms. One day, I received a package in the mail. The package had no return address. I carefully opened it and was horrified to discover it was the same box from the attic that the original key taped to the front. My stomach churned as I opened the box. It was full of Polaroids. The first Polaroid shows the three of us surrounding the well in the forest. Rocky's back is to the camera, but I can tell that he's holding the small coffin we found. The second Polaroid shows Rocky in his sleeping bag by the camp with his red bandana off. The next three Polaroids display dolls similar to the one we found except these clearly depicted us. One wore Rocky's bandana, another sported Sam Chicago Cubs hat, which looked shrunken, and the final one, which appeared to be mine, had jet black hair and seemed made from a different material. All three dolls were photographed in the attic. Three more Polaroids showed what happened to the dolls. Someone set Rocky's doll on fire and twisted Sam's into oblong shapes. They photographed my doll at a different location, resting on a rock in the woods, with a large black crow creeping in the background. I sent the package to the police, who promptly said they would get back to me as they were still investigating Rocky's death. That was three months ago. The assigned detective now sends all my calls to voicemail. I've been in therapy ever since the mayor's office demanded I go or lose my job. I've been a distraction at work recently, and it probably has to do with my appearance. My skin has been slowly falling off. It started a week after I received the package. I noticed small sores on my legs and feet and immediately went to a doctor, who not only could not identify what caused the sores, but denied they even existed. I refused the referral to a psychiatrist and went to get a second opinion, but they all told me the same thing. Meanwhile, the sores grew larger until the flesh literally dripped off my arms and legs. I received more Polaroids of my doll, taken in the same space, but at different times. It appeared to be slowly decaying, starting with the legs and then slowly moving up to its face. In each photo, more crows huddled around the doll. Therapy hasn't helped. My psychiatrist diagnosed me with walking corpse syndrome, rooted in PTSD. Treatment isn't improving, and I'm worried my doctor will institutionalize me. Hopefully, I'll be gone before then. Then they'll see. They'll all see. So I'm here, glued to my screen, as I feel my left eyeball brush against my cheek, typing my story with nothing but bones and spitting out the bile congealed in my throat to warn all of you. The scariest thing you can find isn't a stalker in the woods, a night with no moon, 
or a monster under your bed. It's a key in the junk drawer. And that was My Roommates and I Found a Key in Our Junk Drawer. We finally discovered what it opens by Rahayahem. Rahayahem? Rahayahim? It's a cool name either way. Cool name. So, I like this story. I like this story a lot because there's nothing too crazy going on besides the fact that voodoo dolls are clearly in play. Now, for those of you who don't quite understand what voodoo dolls are, to, to put it simply, they're these little little dolls that are meant to depict a person. Not entirely, just like fairly fairly straightforward, usually made of like straw, kind of bound up together and things like that, string, what have you. And uh, usually to, to bind it to a person, you have to have something of theirs. Like so, In which case, they had the hair for the guy, they had the lock of hair for what I'm assuming was the landlord of the house based on what we're going to talk about later. And then obviously like the bandana for another one, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously whatever happens to the voodoo doll then happens to the person. That's like, that's the whole uh, logic behind how that works. Which, whether or not it's true or not, whether that can actually happen, I don't know. But voodoo dolls are a real thing. They are they are a real thing, obviously steeped in voodoo. Anyway, we're getting, we're getting a little, little sidetracked. So that's just a brief description of that. This story is really good because yet again, it's not too crazy there's nothing too insane going on except for the fact that voodoo dolls are in play which um which is interesting it's really nice to see that that's kind of the problem with the story we've had a different story that did involve a voodoo doll as well which was uh, used by a witch this was the um working in like a coffee shop in the afterlife kind of a thing very interesting so it's exciting to see them be used a little bit more it's, it's not very common to see in stories because, yet again, it's uh, there's a lot you can do with it, but it's just not super terrifying to everybody. I, I get that. I totally get that. It's not a monster. It's not some crazy entity that stalks you forever or something, you know, undefeatable, whatever. It's a doll, right? What I, what I, what I found interesting, though, right? Because when they first find the voodoo doll and the coffin and everything out in the well in the woods, they, they find the one with, with the, I think it's like a blonde lock of hair. And I didn't realize this upon first reading the story, but while I've been editing and putting it together now, I, I realized that um, that when he threw this the first voodoo doll, really random, don't know why he would just decide to do that, you know, I suppose funny, haha. But then they find out that their landlord has a fall. Now you see where I'm going with this? See where I'm going? Especially because they're like, oh, she was in a coma. How could she have fallen? Exactly. But because they threw that voodoo doll, which clearly apparently is connected to her, we don't know why. I don't know why this specific household is the, the ones being targeted for, you know, this voodoo. I don't know why. We don't know any of that. Maybe it started with just the landlord lady, and somehow it's carried on to them. Because it's not like voodoo dolls just come out of nowhere. Somebody has to make them. So somebody is doing all of this to them. We obviously don't know who. But yet again, if they're able to take Polaroid pictures of them, and they weren't aware of this, that's strange. The fact they were able to take a picture of them... While they were all at the coffin, so they're all awake. It's obvious when somebody takes a picture of you, because especially with a Polaroid, it makes a noise. So, strange. Very strange. You know what I mean? Is this an invisible entity or person? I don't know. That's Mr. Milo, if you can hear him. He's a, he's a good cat. Very good, friendly boy. But uh, he's not allowed to be the, uh, with the other cats. They don't get along. Um... But he's very sweet to people. Anyway, um, I, I like this. I thought the story was quite good. Uh, I also found it interesting how, obviously, so um, so Rocky's caught on fire. He burns himself in the, the, the pot and everything like that. And then um, the other roommate had the, the crash. And now and now our, our protagonist, he's got the, his, his voodoo doll is just being attacked by crows slowly over time, which is causing him to go through walking corpse syndrome and all that. And it's just like incredibly sad and depressing the fact that he's slowly being pecked apart by crows, which obviously aren't real crows, you know, because they're attacking his voodoo doll form, not him. But he still feels the effects of what's happening to voodoo doll. It's just, that's a horrifying thought, isn't it? Knowing that you're always going to be... Plus, it makes you wonder, right? It makes you wonder, will he go find it? Because he's being sent a Polaroid. He's being sent multiple Polaroids. I mean, I suppose it's hard to tell where it is. You know, it might not be in the same forest, for example. It might not be in the same area where they found the first food at all. So that totally makes sense. It would be difficult to find when the picture's only of a food at all on a rock. Yeah, completely, completely understandable. Very difficult. It's a good story, though. I really, really enjoyed this. I'm really glad I got to read it and uh, share it with all of you. 
Well, this has been Nate at Night, and I've had a wonderful time, and I sure hope you have too. Let me know what you want me to uh, to cover next. I might even start covering some uh, some mysteries, like some unsolved mystery kind of stuff. I think that'd be quite fun. Just just obviously talking about them, maybe discussing theories and things like that. I think it'd be good. I, I've been thinking about this. Um, I've been told to look into like mass disappearance events and stuff like that. I think that'd be quite cool to cover as well. Just because as much as I love reading stories, it'd be nice to kind of do other things as well. Just just change it up a little bit, but still in kind of the vein of of mysteries, horror, etc., etc. You know what I mean? I'm sure true crime will inevitably become a thing for for me. Maybe maybe we'll cover it, but I feel like a lot of people already cover that. So I don't really want to cover super criminal kind of cases. I, I want to cover more of the mysterious side of things. But I'm I'm open to suggestions. If you would like me to do true crime true crime stuff as well, I'm happy to delve that way. Just curious what your opinions are. Sorry, I keep shaking the table. I, uh, I, you know, I'm one of those people who, who likes to always move a body part. Can't help it. Just a thing. <laughs> Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Where you like bounce your leg or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the same. Can't help it. Can't help it. Anyway, we will see you next time. Take care, peeps. Thank you so much to my YouTube members and Patreon members for all the love and support. Thanks to people like you that we can keep growing.